Okay. Uh, oh, uh, yeah. So let's get started. Uh, welcome back, everybody. So this is the uh, last lecture of the class. This is it. Uh, so the plan for today is that I'm going to review some of the topics, uh, maybe kind of giving you a big picture of the things that we discuss in this class. Uh, kind of reviewing some of the important things that we discussed. Uh, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about kind of what comes after this. Uh, whatever I say today is not going to be part of your lecture, uh, sorry, part of your quiz, uh, but it's kind of like, you know, big picture ideas. So I think I still recommend you to kind of watch this uh, to prepare for the for the for the quiz, but it's not going to be directly like things about like GPUs and stuff like that. I'm going to talk about it's not going to be uh, part of your quiz. Okay. Uh, before uh, sharing you the code, a uh, uh, few important things. Right, your homework is due tonight, so work on it. It's relevant to your quiz. Uh, uh, you have a quiz on Thursday, obviously, so prepare for that one as well. Uh, the, the, the grades for quiz two is coming along. So it's almost there. It's still, I think one question is being still being graded. So we don't have it yet, but let's see if you have it on Thursday or not. I don't know. Uh, uh, and then the projects, so we're going to start grading, uh, all of them soon. So hopefully we'll have most of your grades, uh, out very soon. So that's, yeah. I think quiz three might take a little bit longer because, you know, next week is exams week, so other people have have things. Uh, but that's pretty much it for for the class. Uh, any questions, anybody? All right. So the, the code is V seven W E U V. Yeah, I think we started in, so the question is how many codes do we have? I think it started in three to 17, I think. Uh, so like 15 of them, something like that. Uh, and uh, And then I'll probably just drop one and then the rest will be Palette. That's that's how we go. But you can, as I said before, you can mix and match with your participation on Campus Wire. Uh, I think most people will get it. All right. So Campus Wire has this kind of reputation points that you can see, or like your own reputation points, and based on that, you can you can uh, you can see how how well you have done. Yeah. All right. So last time we discussed uh, synchronization and cache coherency policies. For those of you who didn't get the code, I'll, I'll show it later uh, uh, as well. Uh, we talked about memory models. We talked about solutions for that, uh, fences, barriers, imports, locks. Uh, we also talked a little bit about actual hardware implementation of it using, you know, load link and store conditionals. Uh, so these are important things that I think with your homework six, you kind of also learn about these things. Uh, let us know if you have further questions. Uh, and definitely take a look at previous year's uh, homework too. That's that helps you a lot uh, to kind of get some some examples, some more examples. Uh, any questions about consistency or coherency models? All right. So kind of as I said, today goal is kind of like you know talking about now and what is coming after kind of multi-core systems. So basically kind of like we are kind of at the end of this graph that I showed you in the first slide. And here things are basically getting very, very flat, which means that we are really not getting much out of our, our new systems. Uh, but, but the question is, okay, what comes after this and what is kind of like the current trend and future trends? Uh, 
And the answer to this, that is this, uh, is we're going to kind of like stop at this point when they're going to get faster computers anymore. The answer is no. And the reason that the answer is no is that, first of all, there are evidence of, of, of progress. And second is, we're actually, we have been at this point many, many times in history uh, when we had the, the kind of like a memory war problem, when we had the power wall problem. Uh, like there were many, many times that actually we think that, okay, this is it for us and we cannot make computers faster, but there was always like a solutions that we made and, and we moved forward. And one of the reasons is that the economy of this is we need to make faster computers because these big, you know, semiconductor companies needs to sell new devices. So they're going to pour a lot of, you know, research and engineering in these things. And as a result, everybody kind of benefit, right? So everybody going to, going to get faster systems and, and more advanced and high end systems. Uh, so I don't think that we're going to, we're going to stop at any time soon. We're going to keep finding new solutions. So let me talk about what are those solutions. There are actually three categories that is kind of like, you know, give us uh, future technologies. Uh, one is what we call more, more. And if you remember more was this Moore's law that we discussed that, you know, every 24 months, 18 months, depending on how you want to, want to define it, uh, the number of uh, chips, you know, the speed of the processor kind of doubles, the number of transistors doubles. And as a result, you know, the, the, the performance improves, the power stays constant and all those things that we discussed way, way back in the, in the class. Uh, so the more and more one is, as I'm going to explain a little bit later, is kind of like coming up with this new architectures, new new ways of computing in order to to make these things faster. Uh, uh, two big examples are GPUs and and machine learning accelerator to accelerators. And I'm going to actually describe a little bit, but as I said, those things are not going to be part of your quiz. Uh, the second idea is more than more. Uh, so this is more of like oh, let's actually kind of try to think about this differently and try to kind of integrate and put things differently. So kind of the way that we build computers is slightly different. This is what we call heterogeneous integration. And this is kind of like the, the biggest kind of innovation in this domain is what we call triplet systems. And I'm going to also describe a little bit. And then the third one is kind of going very crazy and then kind of doing things beyond what we have right now, which is all of our systems are CMOS-based systems, right? So what we can do is that if we can find fundamentally new technologies and way of computing, then we might get order of magnitude faster systems. A great examples of this is quantum computing, right? So we, we started having quantum computers. We're still at the very early stages, but as soon we're gonna have like big systems with, with quantum, uh, you know, uh, uh, processing elements, and that could give us, you know, completely different paradigm for, for computation, uh, and that would be, you know, a game changer in some sense as well, of course, if it becomes, you know, a reality anytime soon. So let me talk about each of these three one by one. Uh, the first one is, as I said, more, more, and, and here the idea is that, okay, let's actually make things better in our existing system. So kind of bring out as much as we can. And this is kind of in the short term, this is at the device level, there are a whole bunch of things that you know, companies specifically are working on. Uh, this is more of the idea of how we build transistors, okay? Uh, so we, for example, use what we call high K materials in order to reduce the amount of leakage while we're keeping the capacitance as, as at the desired value that we want. Uh, the, the idea of FinFET transistors and all, all gates transistors that kind of, if you take in any kind of like circuit course before, this is kind of, we think that our system works that this is like another one channel, this is another channel and the gate is kind of like only kind of control this channel from above. But the idea of FinFET and all gates is that this is kind of can be a circular thing. And now you kind of can control this from all around uh, the channel. And this gives us a lot of kind of capabilities. So all of these kind of three nanometer and soon like one nanometer technologies, these are futuristic nano, you know, uh, technologies for building transistors is only possible because the, we, the way that we're building transistors is very different, okay? So these are all about kind of engineering device level technologies, okay? It's well beyond kind of like what we discussed in the class, but for those of you who are kind of interested in going more deeper into, you know, manufacturing of hardware, those are interesting ideas. 
Um, another interesting idea is kind of like the way that we build memories. Because if you remember, I told you that memory is a big, uh, uh, a big bottleneck in our systems, right? So the idea of 3D memories or what we call high bandwidth memories or HVMs, this is one of the important kind of like trends that, you know, industries are, are taking. Uh, so instead of like having a layer of one memory, maybe we can have actually multiple layer of memory on top of each other. And that gives us a lot of memory and very, very high bandwidth between them because these are actually silicon, so they are, they are very fast. So this is actually, you can think about this as more of like a high rise. So instead of like having like flat homes, uh, our systems can be actually kind of like a 3D uh, chips next to each other. So, and then another crazy idea that's, you know, many companies are looking at these days is having like a CPU and then having a memory on top of the CPU. So kind of like 3D IC, which memory and, and, and chip and your core logic is actually connected to each other via some silicon. And why this is important, if you remember back in the day, I showed you that, okay, these are kind of like your cores and this is the kind of the interconnect and then this is your main memory, right? And I told you that kind of this trip, this round trip is very, very slow because it has to go through this very, very slow interconnect. But something like this 3D I see, this connection is, is only a few millimeters or even micrometers, very, very fast. So essentially you can think about this that, you know, the CPU now all of a sudden has this huge L1 cache in some sense. So you can do lots of, you know, very interesting things if you actually have this kind of connection. Well, of course, there are a whole bunch of problems in how do we build this? Because once you're doing kind of like a 3D systems, the temp, you know, thermal management becomes a big issue because now the heat cannot really go out of the systems because now what used to be kind of like heat going in every single direction is now only has a direction of like going down and cannot go up, right? Because you're sandwiching this between other chips. So there's a whole bunch of like, how do we actually manufacture this? But if you do, there are lots of, you know, use cases for this. And this is not just imaginary kind of thing. It's there's actually companies like Micron is actually building this stuff. Uh, so as we move towards kind of more advanced technologies, the hope is that 3DIC becomes uh, kind of a standard method of building chips. And as a result, we're gonna get a significant amount of, you know, performance out of the system, okay? Uh, at the at the arc, so this is yeah question. So the question is, how come mem three D memory makes it make it makes it much faster? Uh, well, this is kind of like let me actually add a page here. Uh, so as I said, like so, this is your core. Let's say you have a two core system. You had like a tiny bit of L one private cache, right? And then we had kind of like an interconnect and then there had like uh, a main memory or L2 cache, right? So this was your memory. Uh, so like things that fit into your L1 cache, you can access it within one cycle, great. But things that doesn't fit here needs to go through your L2 or your main memory. And this, you know, process is very slow. We are talking about hundreds of cycles, thousands of cycles, right? So what I'm telling you is that now if I can somehow like put this on top of this, this core, like I put it here and then kind of connect them via some, what we call vias, which is kind of actually silicon kind of like, you know, tubes in some sense. Then this kind of communication becomes similar to this L1 communication, okay? So like I can access it within cycles. Or if the latency is high, the bandwidth is significantly large. It's kind of like building a highway kind of thing. Uh, so as a result, now all of a sudden I'm back to this kind of original idea that I have, that I have a huge amount of memory in my disposal within one cycle, within a few cycles, right? So all of those problems that I have that I need to solve my processor, wait for the data to come to from the memory and all those things, they're all gone, okay? And for many, many applications, this is a huge deal, especially for things like machine learning. Because machine learning computation is pretty fast. It's just some form of multiplication addition. The huge problem is like bringing all these data because like every kind of layer is huge amount of weights that you need to bring. And we are talking about millions and millions of parameters. 
So if I can somehow manage to kind of bring this in one go very fast, then I can boom, like, you know, you know, uh, uh, compute the whole kind of like a multi-layer, very, very complex machine learning, the, like deep learning algorithm within view cycles, right? So that's how I'm gonna get a huge performance. Yeah. Yeah, so the, so the, so the, uh, comment was most of like, you know, the, the AMD one that has, has this kind of 3D stack puts L3 on top of their memory. The reason for this is that they can, they already can put L1 and L2 on chip. Okay. So L1 and L2 is already on chip. L3 is the one that is kind of connected to the interconnect. So that's why they put it on top of their chip. So they, to get that kind of fast connection. Okay, uh, but the big thing here is that now the latency of L3 is significantly less. So in other words, your miss penalty for L2 is significantly less than what it used to be. Okay, any other questions? All right, so going back here. All right, so at the architecture, architecture level, the idea is customization, okay? So we are shifting more and more toward customization okay what used to be just one cpu and one memory and then say that okay every every kind of application that we have is sequence of these instructions and what we need to build is just this machine that can run instruction one at a time basically what we discussed so far in the class now we are shifting more toward what used to be general purpose processor to more customized hardware units so there are a whole bunch of like different workloads that some of them maybe actually, if you use a different architecture for my CPU, this can be run faster, okay? Again, a big example in machine learning accelerator. So if you look into your devices these days, in your iPhone, for example, you have your general purpose processors, a big core and small core, and then you have a bunch of all these other accelerators. You have uh, what it calls a neuron engine or NPUs, you have different ver version of GPUs, and then you have a whole bunch of like crypto coprocessor, you have MPEG or video coprocessor, et cetera, et cetera. So what these things do is, is kind of offloading that kind of workload that used to be just running on your CPU in this kind of helper units, okay? So I'm gonna discuss this a little bit more and then gonna give you a little bit of examples of how these architectures look like. Uh, so we're gonna talk about this. The other thing that I want to discuss is what we call computing memory or PIM or processing memory or PIM. So this is also getting a lot of traction these days. And the idea here is that, you know, we have CPUs and we have memory, right? And then every data that we need to process in the CPU, we have to go to the memory and bring it, right? So for example, if I want to add two numbers, I have to go to the memory one time, bring one, go to the memory another time, bring another, and so on and so forth, right? So the idea is that maybe I can add like a little bit of logic closer to the memory that can at the very least do some basic stuff, okay? So like adding or multiplication, these kind of like basic ALU operations, maybe it can be done here. And what's the benefit of this? The benefit of this is that you don't need CPU anymore for doing this basic stuff. Uh, the memory just directly connected to this kind of, uh, you know, core logic. And you can actually, if you kind of have something like a 3D memory system, then the bottom layer can be actually the core. And then the top layers could be kind of uh, the memory. So think about this as a kind of a 3D. So the bottom layer becomes the, the logic. And what happens is that, you know, if I want to add two numbers, just this core can actually do it for me. So it reads to this two value from the memory, do the addition and write it back to the, to the memory without any involvement of the processor. And this again would be significantly faster than what we have now because I don't need to kind of bring everything to my CPU, pay this penalty of reading from L1, L2, et cetera, et cetera, right? And again, for many applications, including things like matrix multiplication, that you have a very, very deterministic kernel and kind of activities, this is great. Okay, you can actually kind of run this very, very fast. For genomics, for example, this is very useful. For any sort of kernels that you know exactly what it needs to be done, for sorting, stuff like that, it's, it's, it's very, very helpful. So 
processing in memory or PIM in general is kind of like, or generally what we call near, near memory or in memory computing is the idea that a lot of people are actually working on these days, okay? And then finally, it's kind of like, you know, this is kind of implicit, but thinking about new computing paradigms is also help us to kind of get improvement, right? So the whole idea of cloud computing, for example, is giving us speed, right? Because for example, what you have is, let's say you have a security camera at your home that collects the samples, okay? Uh, one option that you have is that you can do everything locally, right? So you're, for example, you want to do some form of object detection on your camera on your home, and, uh, and then that object detection camera can run on the device itself, on the security camera itself. But your security cameras probably have a tiny bit of processor, doesn't have much memory, so on and so forth. So what we can do is that we can upload this to the cloud and then we have a, like a very powerful cloud, something like an AWS or Azure, so, so on and so forth. And they can actually do this computation for us, okay? But if I have this very fast connection between them, then, then I, I'll kind of virtually have the speed of the cloud and the computation of, of my, my kind of local device, right? So this kind of paradigms of like internet of collaborative things, internet of things, you know, having a bunch of embedded systems that is connected to some servers, all these kind of like new paradigms for computation gonna also give us faster computation speed, okay? All right, so this is kind of uh, the more, more. I'm gonna describe this GPU and accelerators a little bit later. So I'm gonna come back to this, but these things I'm not gonna discuss any further. Any questions so far? All right, so what is more than more? So the idea of more than more is, let's put more stuff in our chips, okay? How do we do that? Basically, it's it's, it's the whole idea of how do we package this, this systems, okay? So we are building what we call a system on chip these days or SOCs. So system on chip is, you can think about it as if I have one piece of silicon, which was the core, for example, the CPU, if I have another, which is kind of like the cache, then I have a bunch of other things. Let's say I have the RF module for radio communication and a whole bunch of other things. What I can do is that I can build those chips separately and then kind of connect them into some form of a PCB, right? But the connection between them would be very, very slow because, you know, it has to go through the pins and pins introduce lots of delays and then kind of like, you know, you're introducing millimeters of distance between them and so on and so forth. So the idea is that, okay, let's actually change this and put them all in one silicon, which we call an SOC. So if you actually look into your SOC, your core is here, all these other modules are also here, and they're all connected via the actual kind of metals that you build in your SOC system. So significantly more complex, slightly more costly, but much, much faster than what you would kind of like build a discrete system that you build all these different chips and then put them in a PCB system, okay? Uh, so the idea is that now I, that I have this capability, Let's bring more things and put them into this kind of SOC because then the communication between these various different kind of components or modules become significantly faster. And the results, I'm gonna get a huge amount of performance. Okay. And and this is kind of the trick that you know your your Mac, for example, is using. So uh, uh, they call it like you know, interconnect fabric or memory fabric. And the reason that you get a huge performance out of your GPUs and your memory system in your M2 or M3 kind of like systems in your Mac compared to like a Windows system that you have is because they have this very, very fast communication between different components in their systems using the technology that they have, okay? Uh, so they can actually kind of like read and write from the memory or from the GPU within few cycles because just this, this communication route between them is very, very fast and very, very high, high end technology, okay? And, and kind of like, the, the direction in this, in this area is even making this even more, uh, more complicated, even put, put even more things on your systems. I'm gonna describe this a little bit, so for now just, just wait for this. But basically what we're gonna get is what we call a heterogeneous integration or HI, 
And, and then you can combine this with the idea of the 3D that I said. So we're going to get something what we call 3D HI, okay? Which you're going to put things both in this vertical direction and then horizontal direction. And you're going to have a very, very complex system that has a bunch of these chips all together into, into one big chip, okay? And we call this a chiplet system, basically. Uh, so I'm going to describe this in a bit. And then the last thing is, as I said, is it's just going beyond CMOS, okay? Uh, so because CMOS, it has its own limitations, right? So we probably cannot go beyond one nanometer technology uh, because basically the kind of size of atoms of, of silicons is around 0 0.1 you know, nanometer, which means that you know, nan one nanometer is probably the end of the story for kind of you know, building technologies in in in, uh, in CMOS. So we need to kind of come up with this other ideas of how do, do we build uh, transistors. Of course, the main one is quantum computers. There's a whole bunch of others, including optical uh, computation and neuromorphic computation. You probably have heard about like analog computing or you've probably heard about sp spike neural networks. So these are kind of like, kind of non-conventional ways of computation which is very, very different than what we have in CMOS technologies. Uh, quite exciting, very high impact kind of ways of doing this. I definitely recommend you if you're interested, you know, think about it. It's a very interesting area for doing some form of grad school or, or PhD on, okay? All right, to kind of, so to kind of recap, so what we discussed was, you know, historically our performance kind of doubles every 24 months. Uh, we, describe a whole bunch of different microarchitectural tricks. And we show that that helps us to improve this by a factor of 21, 25. So this out of order execution, pipelining, caching, branch prediction, you know, uh, fetching and prefetching, all those things that we describe collectively, they significantly help us to, to make computers much faster. If it didn't have any of those, our computer these days would be 25 times faster, what, uh, 25 times slower than what we have right now. So huge, huge difference. And then as I said, we kind of like stopped at multiple stages. The power wall was one of them. Then we introduced multi-cores, uh, but then we are kind of also, we are at the end of the multi-core era. So we need to kind of come up with new solutions. And, and then we are looking at, you know, these various different technologies and techniques. And one thing that I kind of started, uh, kind of motivate you at the very, very first lecture, and I'm kind of going back to this, is that, I mean, the area that you kind of think about hardware and software as two separate things, and they don't talk to each other, is kind of over. Now, what we need now is kind of a co-design between them. So as computer scientists or computer engineers, electrical engineers, uh, you definitely need to know across the stack so that you can actually build real systems, okay? So even if you are just you know, a software developer or system integrator or whatever you're gonna be in future, uh, you need to know this kind of like, you know, whole stack in order to actually be a successful engineer, okay? Or a successful scientist. Uh, so that's why I definitely recommend you to kind of continue looking at this, this step and, and this breath, okay, together so that you become a very well-versed uh, you know, engineer. All right, so let me talk about a couple of those things that I said. The first one is I want to quickly describe what is a GPU and how does it differ from a CPU. Then I'm gonna talk a little bit about an accelerator as another example, and, and then talk a little bit about more than more and triplet systems and we kind of call it a day, okay? Uh, so GPUs, first of all, why do we need GPUs, okay? So if you remember back in the day, we talked about data level parallelism, thread level parallelism, and all those things. So one of the big things that we have is, is data level parallelism, right? So if you remember, for example, I told you that if I have a 32-bit ISA system versus a 64-bit, I'm actually gonna get more performance out of the 64-bit version because I can kind of like add more things at the same time, okay? This is what usually we call single instruction multiple data system, SIMD, okay? So the SIMD systems is actually give you a possibility of doing more things in parallel, okay? So you might wonder that, okay, for 
We're adding two numbers. I don't need parallelism. But now think about if, you, I, if I need to add 100,000 numbers together, then if, if I have a system that can do all these 100,000s all together, then I'm going to have a, like a significantly faster system, right? So GPUs is kind of like, this is the motivation for just GPU systems that essentially they are there to give you huge amount of parallelism for doing one activity at the same time, okay? And again, there are a class of applications that kind of really benefit from this, and you probably guessed it, it's matrix multiplication, which is kind of the fundamental kernel of, of, of machine learning. And if you, again, remember the first uh, lecture that we discussed why computer architecture is interesting is I gave you the example of NVIDIA and told you that, you know, the reasons that we are talking about this chat GPT and generative AIs and, and in general machine learning is that we did have the algorithms, we did have the data sets, what we didn't have and all of a sudden we now have is this, uh, is this powerful machines that we can now train and, and infer our data very, very quickly. Okay, so the reason for this is that we managed to build this very, very efficient data level parallelism algorithms, and the heart of it is basically the GPU systems that can give us this, okay? So this is kind of the idea of G GPUs. As I said, many, many applications, mainly machine learning and AI can, can, uh, can benefit from this massive data level parallelism. In other words, many people say that the killer app for this GPUs is is this machine learning you know and AI applications right? Uh, probably if those of you who have you know stock for for Nvidia probably seen is it's kind of like tripled more than tripled actually in even just in one year. And if you look at it like from ten years ago, you see that this is a huge improvement in the in the value of the company just because you're shifting more and more toward this kind of AI and mobile systems. Uh, so a little bit of history of GPUs. So GPUs, the reason that we call it GPUs is that they initially was intended for graph applications because in graph applications, we do lots of these parallelism for, for, for tracing and for kind of video processing. So we, it's kind of started as kind of just a, this tiny accelerator that sits next to the CPU for just graph workloads. But then with the introduction of CUDA, which is the specific language for, for NVIDIA-based systems, uh, which is kind of around 2006, 2007, the idea of GPGPUs or general purpose GPUs kind of come into the play, which you no longer just need to upload a particular workload. Any workload that you write in the CUDA language can technically just upload it to the GPU and be executed on GPUs, okay? Uh, so any sort of like, you know, addition summations, matrix multiplications, anything that can be basically written in CUDA and can benefit from this huge data level parallelism can actually benefit from, from GPUs, okay? In other words, we kind of create what we call kernels. So kernels is this kind of like container-based container kind of like as in a part of your application. So if you have an application and this little part within your application can actually be parallelized, you create this, what we call a kernel, and then we kind of like, you know, offload this. If this is your CPU, you'll kind of offload this to the GPU. So you ask GPU to kind of calculate this kernel for, for you, uh, and, and then you kind of get the results back. So you kind of send this and receive this. And since this is like very, very fast, within a few cycles, you can get the results, and then you can continue doing your computation with that. Whereas if I had done it on the CPU side, this probably would have taken thousands of cycles because CPU cannot really parallelize things very well, right? So this is kind of the idea of GPGPUs. Uh, if you want to kind of visually compare how does a GPU versus a CPU look like, it's kind of like this. Uh, this is kind of like to show you the scale. So on CPUs, if you remember, we, we told you that, you know, we have kind of a data pass and a controller. Uh, data path was kind of very different functional units, right? And then we have caches and DRAM, which is kind of, you can think about it as part of your, your CPUs, although this is technically your memory. Uh, on GPUs, the difference is that almost all of the, uh, of the you know, 
real estate area for, for GPUs is for functional units. So you have massive amount of functional units, not just four or eight. We're talking about thousands of functional units, okay? And the reason for this is that, as I said, we're going to do the same operation across many, many instances of data, okay? Which we call, as I said, single instruction, multiple data, okay? A SIMD system. Uh, and then you still need, you know, DRAM and caches, but the amount of locality is significantly less than what we have on the CPU systems because, again, it's kind of a one-time use. You just, you know, compute and then you write and then you compute the next one and you write. And the controller is significantly smaller because this is just one instruction at a time, uh, a few instructions. You don't need to have this gigantic ISA with various different things. It's very specific instructions like addition, multiplication, and so on. So we're talking about significantly smaller decoder, fetch, fetch units, and all those things. Okay. So this is kind of like the idea, between, the difference between them. To give you a little bit more. This is kind of a real GPU, actually. This is a Fermi, which is kind of like fairly recent model for, for, uh, for NVIDIA. They call the, their different versions different names. Fermi is kind of like, it's not a brand new one, uh, but I think it's 2016 or something. So as you can, what's that? 20? 11. Okay, so 2011 is, is the introduction of Fermi. Uh, what's the latest one called? Ada? Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. Uh, so this is kind of like what a GPU look like, okay, this part. Uh, so GPU is consists of what we call SMs, okay, simultaneous multiprocessors. Uh, this SMs, for example, Fermi, this, the one that I'm showing you is a 16 SM GPU, okay? Think about SMs as some form of a core. It's not, not really cores, they're, they're, they're SMs. they're SMs, there's different than cores, but uh, analogy to the CPU system, think about this as a 16 core system, kind of, okay? Uh, within SMs, actually, this is, uh, this is a picture of one SM, okay? Uh, this is streaming multiprocessor is actually having a kind of a pipeline system, so similar to the way that we have pipeline systems, um, but it's more of uh, having these kind of things here. So first of all, the majority of this SM is this functional units or in, in NVIDIA terminology, this is what we call cores, okay? So the core itself uh, is, is, has what we call dispatch units, the operand collector units, then the actual functional units, which could be floating point or integer, and then some form of a queue, which is kind of like a reorder buffer in some sense. So each core, and as you can see, for example, here we have uh, four, how many do we have here? Uh, eight, so 32 core kind of system, okay? So each SM has kind of 32 little cores, and then 32 times 16 is the total number of cores that you're gonna get in this GPU systems, okay? Um, and you have some form of caching here, you have register files here, and you have some form of shared uh, cache, additional shared cache for data. So we usually have a cache for instruction and we have a cache for, for data. Um, and one big difference between the, the kind of like a CPU architecture and GPU architecture is that your register file, just take a look at the number of registers that you have in this system, a massive amount, 32,000 registers you have in just one single SM, okay? And the reason for this is that you want to kind of being, re being able to read and write very fast in a huge number of, num you know, uh, cores, right? So massive amount of, of register files. Uh, and then these cores are, as I said, this, these, are, these are the ones that actually kind of collect this, this data, which is, this is kind of like your, kind of your reservation station is slightly different. And then it's actually, the, this is the one that's kind of like, you know, uh, do the actual addition, multiplication, all those kind of like ALU operations that we have, okay? Uh, uh, and then, of course, we can have like, you know, similar to the CPUs, we can have load store units that is separate from your functional units. Uh, and then there is also this special functional units that does special operations in some NVIDIA GP GPUs. You have this. Um, and then, as I said, you have like a big shared cache. And then I don't show you um, the, the other memory hierarchy here, but you can actually see it here. 
that you usually have a large L2 cache sandwich between your SMs, and then you have ports to connect this to your DRAMs, okay? So these are the kind of the ports uh, that's, uh, it's kind of like a DRAM memory controller that's gonna then connect to your DRAMs, okay? So this is kind of like a big picture of uh, of your your GPU systems. And of course, in between here, you have uh, warp schedulers and dispatch units. I'm gonna talk about what is a warp in, in a minute, but basically think about this as your decode and dispatch units that you have in your, uh, in your systems. Uh, GPUs also do some form of renaming. They usually use what we call scoreboard uh, to kind of like, you know, kind of keep track of registers. Uh, but the rest is kind of similar in some sense to the CPUs, the way that we operate. It's kind of like an out of order execution unit if you think, if you want to think about it. Okay. Uh, questions about GPUs, the microarchitecture? Well, of course, each of these things have, you know, uh, you'll probably need a separate course just talking about GPUs. Uh, what's the difference between, you know, various different dispatch units, why we have what we call operand collectors and so on and so forth. Uh, there are a whole bunch of, you know, uh, new challenges because of this massive scales of number of registers that we need to keep track of. But in general, the principles are very, very similar. Yes, so the, the question was the idea of GPU is having a very large CPU that's optimized for mathematical operations. Yes, uh, optimized for parallel processing, let's call it, okay? So if you need to do something in parallel, that all of them needs to do the exact same thing all at the same time, then GPU is your answer. Okay. Uh, so this is kind of like the model for, uh, let me see. Uh, let me let me explain this, and then we're going to come back to that. So these are just terminologies that GPU use. This is mostly CUDA's uh, or NVIDIA terminology. Uh, uh, you know, AMD has its own terminology. But uh, basically, the, the kind of tiny bit of like like the smallest component in a GPU is is a thread. Okay, so thread you can think about this as kind of like a the equivalent of the thread that we have in CPUs. Then combination of these threads create what we call a TB or thread block. So thread block is kind of like units. It's kind of, think about this as kind of a cache block. A bunch of different bytes together kind of move. And the importance of trade thread block is, is that when we want to schedule things, we usually schedule them at block level, okay? So we kind of say, okay, this thread block needs to run in this SM and this thread block needs to run on the other SM and so on and so forth. So all of them kind of runs together, okay? And as I said, most of them are just basically doing exact same instruction, but with different data. So if we, for example, have a 16 thread, you know, 16 thread, thread block system, all of them are, for example, doing addition with just different data. So for example, X0, X1, X2, and so on and so forth, if this is an array, okay? And then thread blocks together will create what we call a grid. Uh, and grid is kind of like, you know, grids together creates that kernel I said, that's kind of like, you know, uh, the, what the units that you kind of upload from your, from your CPU to, to, to your GPU, okay? So again, to, to show you how this works, is that your kernel, okay? This CUDA kernel that you kind of upload from your CPU to GPU, it's combination of this, so this is usually a, a, a grid. A grid, by the way, can be 1D, 2D, or 3D. So you can have X, just X grids, XY grid, or XYZ grid. Within each grid, you're gonna have thread blocks, okay? So each of these blue units is a thread block. And within each thread block, you have threads, okay? So for example, this could be a 16 you know, thread, thread block, or 32, these kind of numbers, okay? So the way that we're gonna execute this is that we're gonna take this kind of thread blocks, okay? And we're gonna assign them into various different, uh, various different kind of like SMs, okay? So for example, this is going to run, like some of it gonna run into one SM, some of it gonna be assigned to another SM and so on and so forth. And then all of these threads basically goes together into the SM, okay? Uh, and then, of course, they might talk to, to the device memory, and then so the results might be written or read 
from the from the device memory as well. Okay. Uh, so this is kind of like you know again uh, the some form of uh, uh, a detailed example of how a grid look like. So a grid is usually within you know consists of blocks. Within each block, you're going to have a thread ID. Uh, the way to keep track of this is that you have what we call a blood block ID and thread ID. So for example, block ID zero, thread ID zero is this guy here. And then everything else is kind of like you can go uh, in different directions. Uh, you can define your the size of your blocks. Okay, So for example, you can say my block dimension is 256, which means that this block particularly gets 256 threads. Okay, so this is depends on your application is the programmer's decision. Um, so this is kind of like, again, the terminology. We have grids, we have SMs, uh, we have cores within SMs. And as I said, we typically have 32 cores per SM and, and they can run simultaneously 32 threads. Okay, the number of cores within SM, we usually call it a warp, okay, because your block ID might be bigger than one warp, okay? So for example, if you have 256 threads per block, I cannot run all of these 256 together because I have an SM that, for example, can run 32 of them simultaneously. So what I do is that internally in the hardware, this is the hardware kind of idea. The software does not know anything about this. Uh, that I'm going to take group of 32 and run it into my system. And I call that a warp. OK, um, so warp is kind of like a hardware level components that is that's not, it's not relevant to the software side. Uh, one of the big challenges in GPUs is branches, because as I said, think about the threads that since all of them kind of doing the same thing. OK, and the way that I'm going to get performance out of the system is that if I can parallelize and, and make them simultaneously running, right? But think about, for example, an instruction here that is an if if instruction, okay? That, for example, say that if data is less than 100, do this. If data is, if the value is bigger than 100, do that, okay? And if you remember, I told you that these are all doing the same, they can only do the same thing at the same time, okay? So now I'm going to have what we call a divergence, okay? That group of data that their value is less than 100 needs to do that operation and then the other group needs to do another operation okay so what used to be kind of like this that i you know they nicely can all kind of do the same thing at some point they're going to diverge okay so some of them going to kind of do some instruction one or multiple instruction and the other is going to do the other the good news is that at some point they're going to converge back together because if you have an if then else, then you're going to go to the next basic block, and, and then at that point, they're going to converge. Uh, so this kind of path divergence, uh, and then how do we deal with that? How do we do reduce that? How do we efficiently use our hardware during that divergence and so on? These are lots of research on the GPU domain for these kind of things, OK? And of course, if, if, when, you, when you're writing your programs, it's the best that you minimize this. But of course, this is not. Uh, you know, kind of completely avoidable. Uh, this is kind of inevitable in some sense. Uh, but the less, you know, convergence that you have, divergence that you have, the better your system, the faster your system going to be. Okay? Questions? All right. Uh, let me give you a very, very simplified example. So you probably, some of you are familiar with DAXB, which is kind of like some form of summations. Uh, the C version of DAXB is kind of like, like this, that you have like a for loop that you kind of like multiply some A and add it to some, some, some other vector and then you update that vector. Uh, if you want to write this in GPU format, then basically what you can do is that, let's say you have a 256 CUDA thread per block. This is, as I said, this is just a, um, this is a definition. Uh, then I can define, so but first of all, this host thing here is, means that this is the CPU side. So CPU is the host and device is, is the GPU, okay? So when I have this kind of term called host, this is the code that's going to run on the CPU side. So they are all in the same binary, but the compiler will understand this and then, uh, and then put this in the CPU side and put the other part on the GPU side. 
So I need to kind of define my threads and thread blocks and grids. So this two parts is basically that. So I'm just defining how the how many number of blocks do I need. Uh, then I'm going to essentially create my kernel. So this part is creating your kernel. Uh, this is essentially saying that this is the number of block and this is the size of each block. And then I'm going to pass the numbers uh, to the to my GPGPU. And then on the GPGPU side, essentially this is the part that I'm going to get a huge amount of parallelism. As you can see, what I'm doing is that based on my block ID and thread ID, then I'm going to just grab the relevant value and do the same operation that I would have done in the in the CPU. The difference between this part and this part is that this part is only running on one core, but this one is running on 32 times 16 number of cores together. That's how I'm going to get a huge amount of uh, parallelism here. Okay. And then all these kind of tricks of block dimension, block ID, and so on and so forth, is just to make sure that we are grabbing the correct data. Because as I said, this is uh, all of them are happening at the same time, so they each one needs to know which exact index they need to grab the data from. So each one is separated by the block, and within each block, they're separated by the thread ID. Okay, so this is kind of like a basics of a very simple CUDA programming. How many of you have, have done CUDA before or are familiar a little bit with CUDA? Okay, a few of them. All right. Yeah, if you take any sort of parallel pro processing programming course, you're going to get more familiar with this. Um, any questions from this example? All right. Uh, and the last thing about GPUs, as I said, there are many, many challenges. Uh, it's an active area of research. I mean, it was, especially like, you know, five to 10 years ago, it's kind of coming down a little bit, but, but still it's an important topic. Uh, branch divergence, thread scheduling, how do we design the register file? What sort of memory should be designed? How the memory hierarchy should, should look like? Is it any different than just a regular L1, L2, L3 cache? Or do we want to do something specific here? The sizing, the bandwidth, how much data should I bring? All those things, these are very, very important questions. Uh, in, in architecting a good GPU. And of course, power consumption is a huge problem with, with GPUs. So those of you who have worked with like large servers, you have probably seen this that you know, this GPUs are very, very power hungry. Um, questions about GPUs? Cool, let's have a quick break, come back and we're gonna talk about accelerators. All right, uh, let's continue. All right, uh, uh, as I said, don't forget your course evaluations, guys. Uh, this is an important thing for us because uh, I personally carefully read it and, and actually change the course based on the feedback, okay? So if there's you know particular areas that you think needs improvement or you have any interesting suggestions, uh, please be specific so that we can actually use it, right? So if you don't like anything, just say, don't I don't like this. Maybe explain what is specific you didn't like about or if you have any suggestions of how we can change it. Uh, so that we can actually use this information to improve, okay? And uh, second thing is that I put this uh, videos on YouTube and keep it public. It's going to stay there. Uh, so you can always come back to the website and the, and the videos. Uh, uh, I'm hoping to kind of like make it public to other people as well. One thing that you can do to help is if you subscribe, we actually kind of like, you know, increase the... Uh, uh, the amount of uh, visibility of, of the channel uh, so people can, 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 can watch it. So, yeah. So if you like it, subscribe, right? Uh, um, all right. So let's continue. Um, uh, so the second thing I want to talk about, again, we are in the more than more kind of area. And uh, as I said, the kind of trend is that, you know, we build good cores, very fast cores, and we build multiple of them, but this is not enough. The reason for this is that there are many, many applications that are like very specialized, 
and we can actually get benefit of a specialization onto our systems, okay? Uh, so once, while we have our general purpose processor, our CPU, we can also have this additional, what we call hardware accelerators, that what they do is they make certain functionalities faster, okay? So still your main kind of point is, is the CPU. So every application goes to the CPU, but depending on the workload, CPU can offload this into a faster components, okay? So this is kind of like, uh, you know, the, the, the execution model that we're following. And GPU was one of those. As I said, many of applications can benefit from a fast SIMD operations. Uh, but beyond that, there's a whole bunch of others. So basically, this is kind of like the model that we have that this is our CPUs, and the CPU is kind of con connected to some accelerators. And doesn't need to be only one, it can actually be multiple of them, okay? And if you remember back in the day, I showed you that we have kind of like a bus, and then things are kind of connected to the bus. So we can have usually two modes of these accelerators. We, we call them tightly coupled and loosely coupled. The tightly coupled ones is that they actually have direct access to the CPU. They're kind of like literally the same thing. They're just like very, very close to each other so that they can actually read and write off of each other on chip, okay? That's why we call them tightly coupled. But not all the accelerators can be tightly coupled because tightly coupled accelerators is very invasive. It changes the design of the processor itself. So we usually also go with what we call a loosely coupled. The loosely coupled one is, is, is think about it as any other IO components that we add to our systems, okay? So we actually can sit into this, this IO bus, or maybe it can have its own specific bus. But in other words, there's some interconnect involved. So it's not like, you know, very close to each other. Uh, the difference between tightly and loosely is the tightly, of course, very, very fast communication between the CPU uh, and vice versa. The loosely coupled ones is the ones that kind of takes more time to communicate. Uh, but if you want to kind of offload and, and then let it be, then loosely coupled is not a bad idea. So if there's like a specific kernel that you offload to that particular unit and then let that unit do its own thing and then get the results back whenever it's ready, then loosely coupled is actually a desired solution, okay? Um, so what to accelerate? There are, there are many, many examples. Uh, back in the day, we had lots of encryption, decryption. We usually call this a crypto coprocessor. Uh, we have like things like hash functions. And then newer accelerators are actually these kind of AI machine learning based accelerators that becoming actually a standard in almost all the systems that we have these days that essentially what they do is, is doing just matrix multiplication fast enough uh, they can do things like convolution as well and fully connected and so on and so forth. But uh, they're kind of good at doing one specific thing, okay? Uh, and in most cases, this is just basically some form of matrix multiplication, okay? Um, so how do we design an accelerator? Uh, the big difference between an accelerator and uh, a, a CPU is that most of the accelerators, not all of them, but most of them are based on data flow architectures, okay? If you remember, I told you that, you know, we are going with this store program order or one human model, which essentially things are kind of instruction based. And we have this PC that's kind of like do this one at a time, right? So things are tr like, you know, your application is translated into instruction and the CPU becomes this machine that kind of runs this instruction, okay? Uh, the alternative uh, way of doing this is what we call a data flow architecture. That there is no notion of instruction. You just hard code your, your actual system and you just feed into in feeding the, the, the data to the system, okay? So give you an example. Uh, so uh, let me give you an example first. Let's say you have this kind of a mathematical operation here that, you know, you have a V that takes A and B and, you know, add them together and then maybe it's one of them multiply them and so on and so forth. Uh, if this is kind of like your final output is Y and let's say your inputs are A and B, uh, your data flow architecture is kind of look like this, okay? So this is your A, this is your B, and then you have an addition here. Uh, this data is also kind of multiplied by two and 
And then these two data seems to be, so this is in this, this one is your V, this one is your W. Then these two are kind of subtracted from each other. And then you also kind of like add them together. And then, and, and then you get your, I think your results. Yeah. Uh, uh, you get your X and Y here. So this is your Y, sorry, this is your X. And this is your Y, right? So your inputs in A and B, your outputs is in X and Y. As you can see, as I change my A and B, my X and Y changes. There is no notion of, oh, this is an add or this is a multiply. I'm basically hard code this design, this data flow. And all I need to do is kind of feeding more data to this and it runs, okay? It's very, very specific to this one particular function. Uh, and that's why it's called a data flow because I'm not changing the control flow, but there is no branching, there's no memory, there's nothing like that. Everything is just reading and writing and then just, just following this, okay? Uh, this is what we call a data flow uh, uh, system. And then essentially instructions are being executed whenever the data is ready. Whenever the input data is ready, they can go inside my data flow architecture. There is no program counter. There's no notion of PC. Uh, uh, there is no ordering between instructions because there is no instructions. Essentially the order is order of data that needs to go inside your system. So if you have, instead of having a control flow dependency, now you have a data flow dep de dependency, right? So you can, if you, for example, you're using the results of previous operation for the next operation, they have to you know, happen in order and so on and so forth. Um, and then since, data, since there is no notion of control flow, this can actually be scheduled offline. So typically the compiler is the one that's kind of decide this data flow because everything we know during, before even the execution begins, okay? So everything is kind of like, you know, pre-scheduled, uh, scheduled offline by the compiler and then feed it into, into your system, okay? Uh, and then you can have like, you know, inherent parallelism in the system. Why? Because as I feed this A and B, this operation and this operation essentially happens in parallel, right? So this operation and this operation are serialized because the results of the, the add impact the sub, but anything that is within one layer, like these two actually happening at the same time, okay? So there is inherent parallelism in the system, okay? Uh, to give you an example, this is kind of like one of the very first accelerator called IRIS, which is like a very famous one for machine learnings. Uh, so the, the architecture of uh, this IRIS accelerator is kind of like this, that we have this, what we call a processing elements or PEs. For example, let's say we have four PEs. In reality, there are more than that. And PEs are kind of like one of these data flow architectures. Uh, PEs is kind of like something like this. I'm going to show you exactly what's happening inside a PE, but think about this as one PE, okay? That does a specific operation, okay? Uh, and then we have some form of memory or buffering, and then we also, of course, needs to talk to the to the DRAM. And at this point, this is also kind of, you know, connected to your CPU, okay? So it's kind of offloading, getting results um, in and out, okay? Okay. Um, uh, so how does this iris accelerator works? It's great for matrix multiplication. So you think about your matrix multiplication is that you have two inputs, uh, your, let's say your image and your filter. And the way that matrix multiplication works is that you kind of like takes this first row and this, uh, this second row, and then you multiply this together and this becomes the partial sums of the first row of your result. Or if you want to not having the partial sums, you can just, multiply this row to this column and get this kind of one content here. But typically what we do is that we take rows, we, we multiply them and we get the partial sums of each of these rows and then we continue until we get all the results. Uh, so this is kind of within each PE as I told you. So PEs kind of like look like this, that we get kind of like um, one part of the image, uh, the bottom part of the filter. This is my partial sum. And then these are just pipeline registers. As you can see, this kind of these two kind of multiply together. The multiply itself is kind of a pipeline system. Uh, and it could be either single elements or it could be multiple elements. All right. 
and uh, and then this goes to the to this value here, the partial sum value, and the partial sum value is going to be kind of go back into kind of the the buffer units. These are my buffer units, by the way. Uh, and then you can have other things like, for example, if you want to override the partial sum with some inputs, you can. These are your buffers and so on and so forth. So essentially the idea is a very simple multiplication plus some addition, right? So we call this a MAC unit or multiply accumulator unit. Uh, so any of these partial element, you know, processing elements are, are just inherently a MAC unit with some registers and some buffers, okay? And if I have enough of these, then I can run this in parallel because I can then take one row and second row, then I can do another row and another row in another part, you know, processing elements and so on and so forth. And then boom, the only thing I need to do is just, just combining this partial sums together in order to get the final results, right? So I think this is kind of like the idea of a bigger picture of this, that one row and one column goes to one processing element, another row and another column, or another row and another row goes to another element and so on and so forth. And of course you need to kind of like collect these partial sum values together to get the, the final value of the real rows, right? So the rest is just mapping depending on how you want to do the computation. It's just, it's just a simple matrix multiplication, okay? Uh, and again, some of it is your weights and some of it is inputs and some of this is your, your partial sums, okay? Any questions from this? So as you can see, this is just, everything is hard coded, but the assumption is that I'm gonna have matrix multiplication and matrix multiplication is this one very known thing. It's not gonna like, change over time. The only thing that changed is the actual value of these, right? So the actual value of this blue uh, rows or this green rows is actually changing uh, through different pixels and through different weights. Uh, but if I can do this multiplications fast enough, then uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna have the results very quickly. Okay. Uh, so there is this kind of like trivial thing. There are lots and lots of research in this area. Uh, things such as uh, how many data flow, how many of these processing elements should I use? Should I reuse things? Should I add just more elements if I want to do more things? Uh, how do I actually design the memory? How the memory is kind of like, what is the size and level? What sort of, how much data should I bring to this processing elements? What sort of bandwidth should I need to use? Should I use shared? Should I use private? Should I use on chip? Should I use off chip? Uh, how my registers and buffering should work? Uh, should I use pipelining? Should I use other optimizations? So there are a whole bunch of these questions that's, that's you know, going around when we're designing you know, uh, accelerators. But the gist of idea is that we're gonna create this data flow and we're gonna kind of hardwire everything. And then we're gonna upload it to that kind of processing elements. And that, that's, that's all we need to do in order to get the results out of this system. Okay, questions? Uh, there are a whole bunch of other examples. So this iris was just one example, not all of them doing the same thing. Uh, you probably have heard about systolic arrays, which is, you know, uh, basis of Google TPUs and, you know, generally Google TPUs or tensor processing elements. Uh, and then there is a whole bunch of, you know, architectures that's kind of change iris in various different ways. And Iris wasn't just the, the only one or the first one. Uh, so different applications, different designs. Uh, there's a whole bunch of various different types of you know, machine learning systems, convolutional versus fully connected, you know, versus residual, all those things. They might require different architectures, but it's not just machine learning. There's a whole bunch of other applications that can benefit from a specialized unit. So not just matrix multiplication, there might be other kernels that can benefit from a design that is specifically designed for that particular data flow, okay? That's kind of the what's going on in the area of domain-specific accelerators or domain-specific hardwares, okay? It's actually still a very active area of research, by the way. Questions? All right, uh, so to kind of summarize them more and more, we are kind of, shifting from just a general purpose CPUs to GPUs and now to accelerators. And this trends kind of continue, okay? 
And then we also kind of trying to uh, think about these kind of 3D ICs and newer device level technologies as well. Uh, on the more than more side, as I said, the big thing is this design of what we call a chiplet system. So a chiplet is kind of like something like this that remember I told you that, oh, I put everything in one chip, one big SOC chip. So we did that for many years, actually. We, we were doing this for like 10, 15 years. But then what happens is that this one chip becomes so big that I can no longer add more cores to it, okay? So now the idea is that, okay, that was a bad idea. Let's kind of step back and, and say that, okay, let's build smaller chips, okay? So going back to the, what we had before, smaller chips, but let's figure out a way to integrate this in piece of silicon itself. Okay, uh, this is typically what we call an interposer, but by the way, interposer is not the only technologies, there's a whole bunch of other technologies. But the idea here is that I can now put small chips, which we call chiplets or dialets, and put them into like one layer of silicon. And the important thing about this layer of silicon is that this is different from your PCB. This is still silicon, so you can do like micrometer, nanometer kind of wiring, not nanometer, but micrometer wiring. And the, still the bandwidth, the connection between these chips is very, very fast. But then another important thing is that now I can put actually a huge amount of chips on this system, okay? So now I can have thousands of cores on this, on this unit. So you probably have heard about these you know, companies that are kind of like building this wafer scale, like massive, uh, you know, chips uh, uh, that, you know, doing machine learning at like very, very large scale. The, the enabler of that technology is this kind of this, this system here. So this one is actually like, I'm taking these pictures from a real system. This one is a 96 core, uh, six triplet system, as you can see here. Uh, this is kind of like what's going on within each chiplet. Uh, so each chiplet itself is 16 core and they have six of these. And then the 16 cores are kind of like this. Uh, so as you can see, they cannot make one chiplet bigger. So they cannot put more than 16, but they figure out a way of kind of how do we put these next to each other. So it's actually they look very neat and, and clean. So these are their six chiplets. That's kind of, they put it into this kind of things here, this colorful things in, in the background, which is the interposer. And it's kind of looked like this. So it's actually kind of with the package and substrate, it looks like a regular chip. But in, in, in reality, these are smaller chiplets that's kind of integrate into the, like a layer of silicon. And then there's a whole bunch of, oh, how do we build this? And I'm not gonna, you know, talk about those things. But of course, if you're interested, you can talk about this uh, later. Uh, this is very exciting kind of line of research because this enables us to do massive scale computing on just one chip, okay? Which used to be impossible in the past. Uh, and this is essentially, as I said, this is the idea of what we call more than more. And the idea here is that similar to the idea of multi-core, told you that we cannot make one core faster, but we can have a massive amount of cores together, right? So chip is kind of like make this process continues. So now you can add more and more cores. Like you have, you can have 96 cores, you can have more than 100 cores in just one tiny bit of uh, silicon, and which is great, right? So this is how we're gonna get performance. Uh, questions? All right, so this is kind of it with the new topics. Just let me quickly kind of overview a few things that we discussed. And, and um, we will let you guys go. Uh, as I said, none of these things that I discussed in the lecture, including G GPUs and access, is gonna be part of your quiz. So this is just for your own information. Uh, so the topics that we discussed, kind of like at very high level, we started with the hardware software interface and we introduced this very, very important topic called instructions at architecture ISA. Uh, then we kind of go deeper into ISA and say, okay, given an ISA, how do I build my systems, okay? And we define that as the mark architecture. So this is basically the, the logic of how do we put these components next to each other, and that was the micro architecture. Then we talked about various different principles, right? We talked about pipelining, we talked about speculation, we talked about parallelism, and these are kind of the key enablers of getting this 
performance out of these systems. Uh, then we kind of pivot and talk about caches and memories. Uh, we talked about memory hierarchy, the reason that it's actually a good idea and so on and so forth. And, and then we kind of like take a step back and talk about the IOs and uh, with the different you know components and today we kind of like completed that we're talking about gpus and accelerators um and 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 then of course we talked about somewhere talked about uh multi-core which for some reason i'm not showing it here but we also eventually talk about multi-core systems as well the problems with multi-core including coherency and consistency okay uh uh, one thing that is uh, particularly, I think, I want you to guys to remember is that kind of like the ideas and tools that we use in computer architecture, and this is kind of like system level ideas that we use in many, many other systems. So it's not just architecture that's kind of benefit from this. Your everyday life, you do use all of these, these you know, techniques and tools. In many other core classes and concepts, you also do this. So what are they? Uh, so first of all, as, is, as you remember, first thing that we usually do is that we use abstraction to simplify models and designs, right? So if you don't need to know everything about kind of details of higher and lower levels, you abstract them away, you think about them as a black box, you define inputs and outputs to them, and then you focus on the problem that you have. Again, this is a very useful tool in your everyday life as well. For problem solving, you don't necessarily need to know everything about everything. You just need to know everything uh, about that particular problem that you have, okay? Uh, the second thing is that you see that we, in most cases, our strategy was making the common case fast, okay? So for example, we talked about branch prediction and we said that, okay, if most of the time we make a correct decision, right? We're going to eventually get lots of performance out of this. Although that, for example, 2% of the time, 3% of the time, we make misprediction. And misprediction actually wastes a lot of cycles. Since most commonly we make a correct decision, uh, eventually we're going to get uh, you know, uh, much, more, much more performance benefit. And again, if you think about the many other systems in our life, most of our systems, most of our economy is actually designed this way as well. The, the common case is the one that you know, has to be faster, has to be the most efficient, right? We're not gonna do things for like very, very rare cases. Um, uh, this, the third thing is parallelism, right? So we use a lot of parallelism for doing things. And again, this is something that we use in our, in our everyday life as well. Uh, pipeline is another one that we kind of like make, you know, make a particular complex task divided into smaller sequence and we try them to overlap, right? So pipeline is an important uh, 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 task and important tool. And then the, the fifth one is prediction or speculation in general that we make a prediction and do something about it. And then again, the idea is that if I guess it correctly most of the time, then I'm gonna get benefit out of this, this prediction, right? Uh, then we talked about hierarchy and hierarchy is also another important concept that we again use in many, many other concepts. I gave you an analogy of library, but if you think about it, there are many, many other things that we use hierarchy as well. And that's kind of like the biggest ideas in computer architecture. Uh, most of them very, very trivial, but very, very handy and very, very useful. And as you can see, as it, again, in your operating systems and compilers and, and even software, many of these things are actually applicable as well, right? Abstraction, common case fast, parallelism, pipelining, prediction, and hierarchy. These are kind of like the main tricks that we use and introduce in this class. Uh, uh, so this is kind of like, you know, some pictures of, you know, modern systems that we are seeing. So as you can see, this is actually an Intel core. Uh, to kind of give you an idea of like how much space is being used. Uh, so the core is kind of here and then most of the core is actually L1 cache, okay? So L1 cache is actually a huge amount of area in any system. Uh, then you have kind of like L2 cache and typically we put L2 cache kind of like this, kind of in middle. And then the shared L3 cache is kind of like usually in the, on the sides, like in one side of the core is usually where the L3 is. 
The other side is usually what we call a memory controller, the interface to the DRAM. And of course, DRAM is kind of connected on the motherboard. It's not on chip with the rest of the system. The reason that this communication is very, very slow is that. Uh, another reason that L1 is very fast is that L1 is kind of here. So it's very close to your core versus L3 is kind of here. So you actually have to go few millimeters or few micrometers away from the system. And that's, that's the delay. Question. Yes, uh, good question. So, uh, so does that mean core one and core three kind of have slower access to, to L1? Kind of, yes. Actually, the way this works is that usually we kind of like put the connection here and then part of this memory is kind of reserved for each of these caches, the part that is very close to them, okay? So that's why actually access to L3 is not uniform. So some access to L3 is very fast. Some of access to the L3 is not actually that fast. Uh, but we, we don't really talk about that. We usually say that, okay, you know, all of our access to L3 is like the same amount of time, but it really is the distance. So if you're really like, it's right in front of you, it's very fast. If it's a little bit to the left or a little bit to the right, it's not. And that's why the memory controller is actually quite smart these days. They put the addresses for that particular core as close as possible. So when we are actually doing address translation, we put them next to them as much as possible. Uh, this is your uh, this is your M1. As you can see, for example, a few things I want to discuss is uh, many of systems, including Apple, using multiple cores. Okay, so they have what we call high performance or P cores, and they have E cores. The difference between them, as you can see, is that uh, the P cores have much, much larger caches. So this one has 128 kilobytes of cache versus the E cores has only 64. Uh, this is ultra wide execution, which means that it's probably 16 issue or something like that. This is just wide, which means that it's probably a, like a four issue or something like that. So that's another difference. Um, the L2 cache is also significantly bigger. So that's how we actually make this smaller, bigger, efficient, or more high performance cores. Uh, this is also the architecture. As you can see, there is this thing called fabric, which is essentially the same idea that I told you about, that this interconnect is actually quite fast. As you can see, they have the neural engine, they have their GPU, they have the cache. Another thing to pay attention to is that this GPU and this neural engine actually has a dedicated kind of buses to their CPUs. And then the DRAM is also kind of on chip. So these are all part of one chip. That's why, again, uh, you will see a lot of performance in your Apple you know, uh, products compared to many other systems, OK? Uh, these are other examples. I think I already discussed this. This is more of an IoT side that you see lots of other peripherals. Uh, and this is another example. Uh, you have like your GPUs, you have codecs, you have LCD. Uh, you have a bunch of these different kind of like other components in your system as well. Uh, so that's it. Uh, one last thing I want to discuss before I let you go is uh, kind of like what I want you to remember from this class. Uh, because, I mean, I have been a student here so and I barely remember anything from any of my classes. Uh, of course, except those that I'm kind of like, you know, using. Uh, but uh, I think it's useful for you guys to know kind of what do I do you want to remember from this class. So I'm kind of helping you a little bit with this. Um, so things I want you to remember is that first of all, this interface between hardware and software, right? So the, the idea of why do we need an ISA and why do we use ISA, this is an important thing. Uh, the idea of abstraction and how this is kind of translated. Uh, and then kind of like a very, very vague and basic idea of what was those instructions. So we had some control flow instructions, some memory instructions, some ALU ins instructions, right? So like a vague idea of those is really what you need uh, for the rest of your life, most likely. Uh, uh, then we kind of discussed various different ways of the microarchitecture. Again, what you need to remember is was there was like some form of controller and some form of data path. Uh, I want you to kind of remember pipelining in general, but uh, I mean, hazards and, uh, and, and forwarding and details of that. 
you probably want, not going to remember and you probably don't need it as well. Uh, I also want you to know the basics of out of order execution. What is different between in order and out of order? And what was like one key things that kind of make us be able to do out of order execution? That idea of retiring and kind of like, you know, reading things in order, but executing them out of order. That's kind of like the gist and like very high level idea. Uh, so hopefully you will remember that. And you also remember there were some form of a speculation and prediction happening in many different components of your system, including branch prediction, prefetching, and so on. So again, remember that uh, there is this you know, prediction going on. So maybe as a developer, you can help the prediction engine to become better, OK? Um, and then, of course, I want you to remember there was cache hierarchy. So hopefully, you know what cache is you know, a few years from now. And, and, and hopefully, you understand why caches are important and performance caches are important. Uh, I want you also remember that there is a difference between virtual memory and physical memory. Again, the details of how the page table works and so on doesn't matter, but there is this translation that's happening in a system that is important. And finally, a multi-core systems and what is the difference fundamentally from a multi-core systems to, uh, uh, to, a, to a single core system and why we have those problems that we discussed, including coherency and consistency just a general definition of what are those problems and kind of like have a very basic idea of how do we solve them. Uh, we use some fences or memory model. Again, the details probably you won't remember depending on which type of careers you're gonna have, but knowing that there are solutions including some form of mutual exclusion or some form of producer consumer uh, format is, is hopefully is what you're gonna remember and you're gonna use, use it in your future courses. Uh, and then, as I said, these are kind of system level techniques that I described to you, make the common case fast, uh, speculate, and you can always speculate in your real life as well, right? So take calculated risk. And if you're, you know, if you're right in most cases, you're going you're gonna to be successful. Uh, using the hierarchy in many different aspects uh, and pipelining, and then, of course, parallelize as you can. And, and, you know, listening to, uh, this is kind of irrelevant to, to the computer architecture course, but listening to the experts of the field in any field that you're working on is, I think it's an important thing. So many people kind of like try to have their own opinions about different things, but always like as a scientist, as an engineer, I feel like it's important to know that, you know, whatever we do, but the reasons that we kind of as human beings, we are kind of progressing is that we always like take that, that scientific approach, right? We kind of use science to kind of prove or disprove various different things. So for every other aspects of life, maybe you should do the same thing, okay? Uh, and then I want to also say that there are various different things that we didn't discuss. So if you go to this, you know, first day of your job and, and your, your boss say, oh, okay, we have a VLIW processor and you have taken, you know, you got A or A plus in your computer architecture course. So help me with that. You can kind of like, you know, point to this slide and say that, you know, our professors didn't, you know, cover. Uh, so there is a whole bunch of things that we didn't have time to cover. VLIW is like a different way of kind of uh, kind of decoding and running processors, uh, which we didn't have time to talk about. Uh, we didn't. They talked a little bit about security, but we didn't have time to talk much about it. We didn't talk about storage systems. We didn't talk about vectorization and vector implementations. We didn't talk about you know large scale, server scale, you know warehouse level systems. We didn't talk much about power and low power computation. And finally, we didn't talk much about compiler and the role of the compiler. Here and there, I kind of discussed it. Here and there, I also discussed OS, OS as well and the role of OS. But you need like a proper courses in these two areas, separate courses to kind of learn about these, these things, OK? Uh, and then last thing is that watch this video in your free time uh, if you want. Uh, this is actually uh, the talk by Hennessy and Patterson, which are actually the author of the book the book that we are using. Uh, they are uh, very prominent researchers. One of them is uh, you know, a distinguished professor at, at Berkeley, uh, uh, Patterson, which is kind of now retired, but work as kind of like a senior level at Google. Uh, John Hennessy used to be a Stanford president. He's actually my great grandfather academically. Uh, so we are, we are related. Uh, 
but uh, so this is the talk that they gave in 2017. The title of the talk is the new golden age of the computer architecture. And, uh, and this is when they won the Turing Award. Uh, the Turing Award is kind of like the equivalent of Nobel Prize for computer scientists, because computer science doesn't have a Nobel. Uh, but if you win a Turing Award, it's kind of like, your, like the highest possible thing that you can achieve in your, in your career as a computer scientist or computer engineer. So this is when they won it, and this is the talk that they gave in the acceptance of that. So they actually kind of like, this is like a one hour talk. They talk about like, many of the things that we actually show you, like including this kind of like uh, the slides of like, you know, different times. This is actually from their book and from their talk. So many of things will be familiar, but it's an interesting kind of vision that you can see from, from them. Uh, so I definitely recommend you to, to take a look at that, uh, maybe during Christmas if you're bored or miss me. Uh, you can also follow me uh, on this social media account. So I have a Twitter account, which is quite active in LinkedIn. Some of you are already friends with me. Uh, I, uh, my cats have an Instagram account if you want to follow. Uh, uh, my personal website is, is here. Our, our lab website is also here. We kind of like, you know, if you want to do research with us, uh, happy to, to talk more about all of those things. Um, yeah, evaluation. Uh, quiz three going to be uh, whatever we discuss after quiz two. So after the cache beginning of kind of memory and virtual memory. Uh, up to the things that we discussed last week. So as I said, this this particular lecture is not included, okay? Yeah, that's it. Thank you, guys. <laughs>